Thomas sir from Bangalore, Professor Gupte, my colleague from Mumbai, Commander Abhishek Kannan from Mumbai, and uh, Colonel Venkatraman again from Mumbai, who are my co hosts of the program today. Welcome on this uh, 73rd birthday uh, celebration on in the capital and all across the country. What a magnificent day! What a magnificent day to uh, to join you and to launch the first webinar of Brahma Research Foundation. Welcome, sir. Very briefly, uh, Brahma Research Foundation is a global strategic think tank focusing on public policy and strategic issues, both national and international, in the context. It is an independent, private, non-partisan, non-profit research organization. It's principally to influence popular policy and implementation. Today, today we are having a, a webinar with the participation of four distinguished authorities here, uh, led by Jaran sir. And the topic of today's today's next topic of today's webinar is dynamic Indo-Pacific theatre doctrine. This on the 26th of Jan, we are discussing this August issue because that's something the clouds all around tell us. What is Indo-Pacific theatre? It extends from the Arctic Ocean in the north to Antarctic in the south, Asia, Africa, Australia in the west, and Americas in the east. An area of almost 63 million square miles, 46% of Earth's water surface, 30,000 islands and over a dozen plus countries, a vast area by any standards. The Coral Triangle is rich in marine and natural gas wealth with almost 1.5 trillion USD accounted for by these countries. The Straits of Malacca account for one third of the global trade, 60% of China's trade, and $200 billion of India's trade passes to this corridor. So we're talking about this critical area of Indo-Pacific. What is the Gara is talking about? The broader Asia concern for first propounded by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe on 22nd of August 2007. He addressed the Indian Parliament and mentioned about the Indo-Pacific region. The United States promoted the strategic dialogue of war in the U.S. in 1670 and President Trump took it to the next stage. Thus, war of India, Japan, Australia and U.S has come together and find financial money. Multilateralism are the avenues in which consultation has worked together continuously. We are also participating in joint defense strategy dialogues and exercises in other quad members. On the other hand, the Chinese are pursuing their own uh, strategic programs of OBAR, what is known as the Belt and Road Initiative, across the, the Asian continent across Africa, and more critically, the CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which runs from the Gadar port across Pakistan and the occupied Kashmir zone. It is these advances all around, developments all around, which are the cause of the gathering storm. That's the best what is actually being witnessed here is a string of pearls. What is it to lose? Coastal Chinese strategic maritime facilities from Horn of Africa with the Chinese mainland have been built in the last two decades by the Chinese. The latest naval bases at Jibu, Dutwana, and Hamadwana are a clear indication of the design. And the, and the content of the string of pearls. While this has been going on, India, with its own maritime and strategic considerations, is developing its own necklace of diamonds, facilities in Singapore, Shabaha, Seychelles, Oman, they are being exchanged. And the intentions are clear. 
the last two points as a counter to the strength of words and to ensure that it doesn't become loose. We are also an outreach to Sri Lanka, Mauritius and Bangladesh, as well as Vietnam and latest in Philippines, reaching out to these countries in economic and strategic spheres. A response to the Chinese aggressive desires. The process is very clear. The process says that when the Chinese pearl of strings is put around us, we shall counter effectively in every dimension. The purpose today here with the experts all, all here in consultation is to ensure that it doesn't become a news. But what was the trigger for organizing this, this workshop on Indo-Pacific? The trigger was the AUKUS Pact for building and supplying nuclear power submarines to Australia, which has come as a surprise to even to the collaborators of those countries. Through that, through that single move, what we have found that apart from the strategic nuclear stealth dimension, there will be sharing of critical cyber capabilities, artificial intelligence, and quantum tech. This induction of a nuclear stealth deterrent to in the Pacific region is a paradigm shift. Because nowhere have the Americans or the Western powers transferred the critical nuclear stealth tech to, to any outside country. And their open arms welcome to Australia for this clearly indicates that there is a message somewhere hidden in this move. Therefore, we thought it was appropriate to take up the process of developing a monograph of, of the dynamic Indo Pacific theater. And to, to do that precisely, we are here today. There are four parts of this monograph. The first is the economic and strategic dimension of Indo Pacific region, presented by Professor Gupte and myself. The second is the India's counter strategy in South China Sea. Colonel Venkat Raman would be presenting that. The third is the strategic nuclear submarine deployment and challenges for Indian Navy in the Indo Pacific region, presented by Commander Abhishek Kandan NM. And last, the most critical part surveying the entire landscape would be the dynamic Indo Pacific theatre doctrine presented by Jandu Piji Kamar, the veteran and the senior most the senior most functional in the group. Through these, through the collaboration, through the collaboration of these four uh, gentlemen, distinguished in their own capacities, we are presenting the Indo-Pacific Theatre Doctrine. Here I would uh, here I would submit that uh, Professor Gupte, who was to join us, unfortunately is not keeping well. So I would be presenting that paper uh, in his absence. So uh, very briefly, I would read out uh, Professor Gupte's introduction. Professor Gupte has been my colleague for over two decades in the Institute of Management program that we have followed. Uh, he has been a strategic thinker, having contributed to various defense dialogues across the country. He is a, a professor of, of marketing management, but more precisely, he is a strategic advisor and a dynamic functionary in various discussions in the strategic, in the strategic and defense paradigms. He is a, an emeritus professor of the Rashti Raksha University, a senior fellow of VPM Center for International Studies, trained in uh, international relations complexity science, ecology, and member of the Forum of Integrated National Security. On his behalf, uh, I will be presenting the paper and his, his absence is regretted. So, um, what is the title? The title of the paper is Economic and Strategic Dimensions of the Indo-Pacific Region. As evident in the, in the growth of the last six decades in China, the three decades from the last two 
decades of the, of the 20th century, China has witnessed a double digit become a GDP growth. Almost till 2008, when the global crisis hit us, they were galloping. Their economies were growing at 10, 12, 14 percent growth rates. While there can be a statistical doubt about the, the number and, and the quantities, there was no doubt that till 2008, when the global crisis hit us, they were simply galloping in their growth of the GDP. Of the GDP. But post 2008, there has been a fall in exports. Imports have also as well come down. There is a slowdown of FDI and the 2019 figure of 6%. It's very difficult to believe, but it's there. And uh, in 2020, it was 2,000. It was 2.3%. All these darkening clouds caused a crisis because they had huge overcapacity in, in all the strategic sectors, whether it was steel, or cement, or other infrastructure outcome. There is a possibility of RMB devaluation. And financially, there is an economic meltdown as witnessed in China. The present internal debt is 3.7 times of the GDP. There are defaulting corporates, first time witnessed in China in large numbers. The share market has its own woes. But its heavy dependence on oil and gas imports from Middle East continues. So, in order to shake the ill effects of the economic crisis, China had to get out and find out options. And they responded it by in two dimensions. Dimension one was the string of pearls, where aggressive strategic posturing and maritime dominance of Indian Ocean was started. At strategic locations, bases were identified. Funding was given to build those harbors, to build those boats, a result of which the countries were led to indebtedness. And then some concessions which would have been novel and difficult to come across have been sought from them. So the strangle post was put in place at the same time. Work on infrastructure projects by the OBOR and, uh, and BRI initiatives were undertaken so that the infrastructure capacities or developed the cement, steel, etc. could be utilized and the Chinese labor could be put on job. For example, we find that uh, uh, the CPC in Pakistan, the China Pass, the Common Corridor, thousands of Chinese are working. Not only that, there are uh, there are possibilities of large number of troops being placed in one form or the other to protect the CPC. The strategic intentions of which therefore are well known. There were efforts in Thailand and Maldives, which have been partly halted due to uh, our activism. But the string of pearls as a strategic response is there for the state. What has been our response in all these years? We, on our own, have I tried to identify the strategic resources like lithium. And we are planning to move from to sodium ion batteries. Our rare earth resources, 90% controlled by China. Some options are being sought out on that. We have launched the semiconductors initiative in India as a response to what the Chinese have been planning on the large scale. We have definitely established outreach to Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Myanmar hello. to work out financial and tech support. Ah, hello, sir. The closer security network in the Indian ocean it? region is also underway. That has been our response in the region. But all this is still falling short or the wider security framework that needs to be set up. There is need for a highly dynamic maritime security adoption. This will be strengthened by removing the burden which is there on the Chinese dead trap countries by taking help of Quad. Okay, okay. An open dialogue with Taiwan is undertaken on screen nay currently screen me to break through the diplomatic 
outsourced the diplomatic he had uh, band which he had indicated earlier we are trying to extract rare earths from the sea that's the Japanese collaboration and that needs to be taken up seriously like quad one there is need for quad two this is other South China so that the quad area of operation and consultation becomes wider and even very very out of the world and dynamic security measures like renaming Pongbong So as Pongbong C and then applying the Uniclos norms so that every time it's not that we respond to what the Chinese are doing we take some steps and declare the Pongbong So area as the boundary as our international boundary not just a lake to be shared from these countries so the economic and strategic dimension of the Pacific region <laughs> demand necessitated a, uh, a maritime security doctrine and that is precisely the, the effort that is underway. I uh, thank you every one of you for having uh, shared what Professor Gupte had to say and now uh, we move on to the, the next part, the next part of the program which is um, for which I will invite Colonel Venkatavan, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Sir. Sir, very briefly, I will uh, just introduce you and then uh, we'll share and uh, then you can start, sir. Right, sir? So, Colonel Venkatraman, sir, has 25 years of service in the Indian Army as an officer of the Corps of Engineers. He has served in various positions, technical, supervisory, and managerial. A very educated and talented personality with an excellent technical knowledge and communication skills. Having a master's degree in business administration from Anna University, Chennai. He went on to get his master's degree in psychology at the University of Madras in 1998. He was awarded Army Commander's Eastern Command Commendation Card in 1983 for exemplary service beyond the call of duty while constructing fortifications at a high altitude in Sikkim region. He has also written several articles uh, um, in journals like Indian Road Congress Seminar Proceeding 1996, Institutional Engineers Seminar 1998, and uh, Indian Road Congress Seminar Proceeding 2003 on Civil Engineering as subject an eminent strategician, a serious student of the subject and highly emotionally charged in this entire exercise, I would request Colonel Sir to start his proceedings as we share the screen. Colonel Sir, morning. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sir. I'm very kind of you to have uh, given such a wonderful introduction about me. I am just a humble worker in the entire team. And uh, certainly, I won't take much time. Uh, I'm sharing the screen straight away so that you all know what I'm talking about. It's a small contribution that I've made. Just a minute. <coughs> yeah, I hope you all can see the presentation. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Yes, sir. He's going up a bit. One second. Yeah. So this is where we are starting and uh, I'll put it on the slideshow. So as uh, brought out very well and eloquently by uh, my, my uh, senior just a few moments ago, um, there is a lot that is happening in the South China Sea and there's a lot that we as India as a country need to do in the South China Sea because there's something happening in our backyard, you know, the Indian Ocean region, Iowa. So so let me just quickly tell you all about the uh, what I have written about. So my, my paper is purely about a counter strategy that we need to develop. And this is a prelude to my paper that there is a dispute today <clears throat> very strongly happening in the South China Sea. And the, 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 chi, the key <coughs> perpetrator uh, who is the initiator of the dispute obviously is China. Okay, so China has pursued a strategy of delaying the resolution of the 
dispute in the South China Sea. And uh, basically, they are trying to say that the Prattley Islands and the Paracel Archipelago is theirs, much to the discomfort of the nations who have equal access to it, like Vietnam and Malaysia, the, the South China, the, 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 the countries in and around South China Sea. So the delaying strategy that China very cleverly pursues is mainly to prevent the escalation of tension. So at, the, at one time, he keeps talking about, you know, his, uh, uh, China's uh, <clears throat> uh, that claim to that area. But then they do it in such a way that it never really heats up to such an extent that people start, you know, going all out against them. So very smartly, they play a double game. And this was in 1958 that China first linked its claims to a territorial sovereignty and rights also to territorial waters in the South China Sea. <clears throat> and the phrase, or how they have conveniently phrased it is, China has indisputable sovereignty over the Sprackly Islands or the South China, South China Sea Islands and its adjacent waters. So Paracel Islands also form part of that you know, claim. Okay, so as a result of China's ratification of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, that is the UNCLOS, in 1996, the competition has become, you know, fierce to <clears throat> assert and exercise maritime rights. So they've got to prove that their justification and rights over those islands. So China wants to ensure that it would be able to negotiate from a position of strength. So how does it do this? It keeps, uh, you know, its uh, strategy of uh, pushing nations, bulldozing nations, its belligerence, which you would see in my uh, slides that I'm going to share. With you. So <clears throat> this is an example of China's belligerence. 2019, Haiyang Dizi, a China's giant Chinese service ship involved in the standoff with the Vietnamese drilling ship Akuru in Vietnam's EEZ. Remember, it's Vietnam's EEZ that China has entered. April 2020, the same Chinese survey ship reached off the Malaysian coast, coast to shadow closely a Malaysian oil exploration vessel, West Capella. Then, in February 2020, a Chinese ship turned weapon control radar against a Philippines warship. So they are pro proving their belligerence time and again. 3rd April 2020, the Chinese have sunk a Vietnamese port in the Paracel Island. So what's the importance of, you know, uh, the South China Sea for China as well as for South China, Asia's economy? Firstly, almost 60% of all maritime trade in the world passes through Asia, with the South China Sea carrying approximately one third of all global shipping. And secondly, its waters are <clears throat> particularly critical in respect of sea trade lines with China, Taiwan, Japan and South Korea, all of which rely on the Strait of Malacca, which connects the South China Sea and by extension the Pacific Ocean with the Indian Ocean. So these are <clears throat> critical lines of shipping for all these countries. What about India? What are India's interests in the South China Sea? And why should we be keen? Because India too uses the SCS waterways, the second most used in the world, for trade worth nearly US $200 billion every year. And nearly 60% of India's trade with countries in the Indo-Pacific Indo region passes through the world. So rightfully, we do have a right to, you know, uh, uh, to have our claim, at least on the waters, if not the islands. What about the string of pearls? Now, string of pearls has been very eloquently already spoken to uh, about by uh, Dr. Page in his session, but I'll give it a little more uh, detail. So India refers to the string of pearls. Actually, it was coined by the US, but we have it's tagged on to us now as a geopolitical agenda that reflects the Chinese intentions in the Indian Ocean region by connecting through a system of Chinese military and commercial activities around the sea lines of communications that commence from mainland China to the border of Sudan in Africa, encircling the Indian Peninsula. So the entire thing forms a kind of a string of pearls, uh, you know, uh, it's around the neck of the Indian Peninsula, as you can see in the figure that I will be showing you shortly. Now, why is India concerned with this string of pearls? 
Beijing claims it has a legal rationale for developing port projects in the IOR. Hamman Tota is already belonging to, it's about a nine, I mean, he's already taken a 99 year lease with Sri Lanka for developing port projects in the IOR as in the center for international trade. But many countries comprehend these projects are extremely security oriented in strategic terms. And with special concerns, India is justified in believing the US Defense Department report and therefore keen to chop up policies in response to the so-called spring war. So we've got to take action to counter this kind of aggression that China is doing in the Indian Ocean region. <clears throat> so take a look. <clears throat> we already have background in our uh, webinar, but nevertheless, this very clearly shows the political influence of China in and around the Indian Peninsula. Okay, so Gwadar, Hamban Tota, then Chiragong, these three, it's already, you know, China's wielded, wielding tremendous influence. And then when it continues beyond, it goes right up to South China Sea. So now what are, what can be India's counter threat? This is something that I thought I would give as inputs. We already have access to Chabahar port in Afghanistan. 23rd of May is something that we have, uh, you know, been able to get access. We've got ties with Maldives. Now, Maldives, what exactly are the ties? Let me explain to you uh, what exactly the ties are as far as Maldives are concerned. Now, as far as Maldives are concerned, Maldives is a port, I mean, in fact, it's a country which uh, is in the Indian Ocean region. And uh, in 2016 April, Maldives and India patched up their differences and signed a crucial action plan on defense cooperation. As far as India, uh, India and Sri Lanka are concerned, we have signed bilateral agreements, the main one being the ISFLTA. That, that means the Indo-Sri Lanka Free Trade Agreement. Then India is also focusing on economic considerations to boost ties with Sri Lanka. And India is planning to build Trincomalee port in Sri Lanka to counter the Chinese support with Hamban Dota. As far as the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are concerned, India has installed harpoon blocking missiles, uh, then MK-54 lightweight torpedoes, rockets, depth charges in the Bay of Bengal. Much more on that will be explained to you by my uh, worthy colleague, Commander Kan Kan, who will be speaking after me. We also have access, yeah. Then, uh, the India is also planning to provide a proposal to Vietnam on a battleship armed with BrahMos missiles. India is supplying patrol boats under a credit line of $100 million to Vietnam. Vietnam has granted permission to the Indian Navy to anchor its warships at Nha Trang Port in South Vietnam. And we can also look at a place to park a fighter air. This is again a possibility. As far as Australia, India and Australia are concerned, both countries perceive Chinese activities as threat. They are part of the Quad, which has been aptly explained, and in response to China's naval ships and submarines in the Indian Ocean, both India and Australia has strengthened their maritime cooperation and are conducting joint exercises. As far as India and Japan finally are concerned, Japan and India have developed enhanced economic uh, networks throughout Africa and Asia under the partnership of the AAGC, the Asia-Africa Economic Corridor, in January 2007. Maritime cooperation being one of the key areas of Indian-Japan cooperation, Japan is currently participating in the Malabar exercises with India and the US. Credible Indo-Japan security cooperation initiatives can also serve as a strategic conflict to China. So summing up, the reason for ETHR for India is that its economic vitality rests on an assured supply of energy as also ensuring safe and secure trading routes in the region, including the Straits of Malacca. It has high stakes in keeping the sea lanes open in the South China Sea, the junction between India and Pacific Ocean as many other countries in the region do. Today, India is taking a more vocal stand on declaring the South China Sea as a global maritime group with equal access to all, wherein all disputes should be settled in accordance with international maritime law. So India is not just looking east. It, India is, in fact, moving far. Okay. So I think I'll close now. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, uh, for your brilliant exposition of the, of the crisis that is brewing and that the that the pearl of the pearl of garden doesn't become our news and we don't lose all our 
all our diamonds. So thank you very much, sir, for uh, your brilliant presentation. So kind of you. So, uh, dear hosts and uh, friends, now we can uh, move on to the uh, next presentation, uh, the third paper, uh, which is being presented by Commander Abhishek Kanwaj. Can you join me, sir? Yes. Abhishek Kandan, sir. Yes. Can you see me? Yes, sir. Okay. One moment. Thank you. Join that. Thank you, Dr. Park. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Colonel Blanchard. Sir, not yet. You are not visible, sir. Sir, he is. Sir, we can see him. We can see him. Okay. Yes, sir, we can oh, see lovely. him. Fantastic. Oh. So, with your permission, sir, I will briefly introduce you and then you can take over. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Commander Ravishek NM is an alumni of IIM in Indore and a Mount Everest submitter with 28 years of experience in the field. He has seven years of experience in industry and prior to that for 21 years he was with the Indian Navy. In addition to being a corporate trainer and motivational speaker, he has been a Marine Commando and conducted various operations as a submariner. A scuba diver, a paratrooper, and an awarded Nausena Medal by then President of India, Prof. A.B.J. Abdul Kalam, in 2005. He is a recipient of the Chief of Naval Staff, Commander and Chief Commendations on three occasions for gallantry, leadership, and innovation. Executed the record of creating longest single continuous dry micro tunnel. 670 meters by 22 meters in the country, which is featured as No Dig India magazine uh, in the April May 2017 edition. He has been, after his service from the Defense Services, he has been doing exemplary work in infrastructure development as well. So, from the Mount Everest summit to the bottoms of the ocean, Sir Commander Ravishek, can please take over, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Page, for the introduction. Uh, well, I will be covering the uh, naval, mostly the submarine part of it. So, I will just start my presentation. I hope it is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, yes it is visible. So, the topic is strategic nuclear submarine deployment and challenges for Indian Navy in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, before I start, there was a person called Alfred Mahan, you know, two centuries back, and he was a he was a naval officer, and then he went on to become a historian, and he has written a uh, number of books. And what what he said that time, that whosoever rules the waves rules the world, and that's what we are seeing, various powers in this world trying to dominate the seas. He also said that whosoever controls the Indian Ocean dominates Asia. This ocean is the key to the seven seas. In the 21st century, the destiny of the world will be decided on its waters. And that's exactly what's happening now. And that's how we are, we are placed today and we are having this webinar. Well, I will move to the roles and importance of submarines. Yes, as it was stated earlier, we have a nuclear triad and we have a no first use policy. Now, once you have a no first use policy, then the water element, the marine element becomes of most prime importance. So, no one can make out from where the nuclear arsenal is located and therefore the enemy cannot strike or can't even come to me. That's how the, the role of submarines becomes so important. And yes, as we brought out, you know, these are slocks, sea lines of communication all over. Every country is relying on petroleum products and the trade, the raw materials, economies depend and around 90 to 95 percent of the trade happens through sea and as was brought out even you know the Indian Ocean region there's a lot of trade happening with it, which is very critical for the Chinese and of course also for the ASEAN countries and the countries which are sending it. And 
reason why we have only talked of the Chinese design. I'll later on cover a bit more. Uh, so we have to recognize their design and then we have to be ready for it. Submarines provide this great, great, uh, you know, power of sea denial and sea power. You know, even in case of an asymmetry in the numbers, a single submarine can cause havoc. And therefore, submarines are force multipliers. So as we see the Indian Ocean region and the South China Sea, uh, we will notice, you know, uh, that Pakistan, uh, the China has got the various, uh, you know, places where they can use for military purpose and also for economic purpose. They also have this policy of the maritime still food string of pearls has already brought, brought out, and of course this. This policy of you know, trying to unite all small powers against the big India. So, as we see, most of the economic activity is happening in the Indian Ocean. You can see where the Chinese have built their ports, where the India has its assets, and then, of course, these are the areas to the South China Sea which are which are very critical. Of course, there is also other things like piracy happening. There are listening posts, there is a naval post in Diego Garcia. So every every country in the world is trying trying to have their feet in the Indian Ocean. And we are best placed for it. So submarines are the most powerful and versatile, the most secure and least detectable of all the naval units. Or for that matter, all units. They are invisible, they are lethal, and they are in a dimension which can cause real hammer, havoc. I'll just show you a small video. Uh, this is the only time one can actually detect or see a summary. That's the only time one can actually see it. Otherwise, under under underwater and not detected. Okay. Uh, now coming to submarine classification. These are the hull classification. I thought I would give you a bit of exposure about the submarines. There are conventional submarines which are diesel-electric. Uh, so that is diesel, which charge batteries, and the submarine goes. So they are SS, ship submersible or ship submersible killers. So these are conventional ones and then there are nuclear submarines. Now nuclear here refers to the nuclear propulsion and we should not you know, get confused with the nuclear weapons. So they are SSNs, there are SSGNs that is ship submersible guided nu uh, missiles, uh, nuclear propulsion or ship submersible ballistic missiles, nuclear, uh, nuclear propulsion. Some of the characteristics uh, which uh, we need to know about submarines is the stealth. As I told you, they are the most stealth. You really can't make out where the submarine is. Very difficult to detect. And there is something called indiscretion rate. That is the time when there are greater chances of a submarine being detected. That is once it comes uh, a bit 9 meters below surface, surface to uh, charge their batteries. This is valid for only conventional submarines. Mobility is another issue because submarines move at really very low pace. You know, for a conventional submarine, five, not, five knots is a speed, which is very less. So, because of which you have to plan your things in advance. The weapons, uh, they carry the missiles, the torpedoes, the towed array, uh, the sensors, uh, uh, the sonars, and of course, endurance is another thing uh, which restricts the submarine's operation. And communication, underwater communication is, uh, uh, is very difficult, still the technology is evolving. But these are the characteristics which are involved once you once you plan any submarine. So I've been there, so I thought let me share a few photographs uh, of my submarine time. Uh, this is in the control room. Uh, that's where from where the submarine is steered uh, to go down, go up, or left or right. That's that's when the submarine was on top. So things like that. This escape suit, which is required in case there is an uh, emergency on the submarine or it is sunk, so it, it's also a very difficult thing. So submariners have to go this training before they can, and space is a big constraint. 
uh, in the summer it is the ward room which is used also as a hospital and also for the officers so we have a squadron system in which we support the submarines uh, submarine crew so we have a squadron both in the west coast as well as the east coast i'll just show you a, a video of of a submarine uh, it is a very candid video uh, so uh, uh, this is the engine room just to understand you know how how difficult it is for a mariner Trade is happening. 
those interdictions, offensive mine laying, and clandestine operations, you know, including special forces which can be put across, like Marcos can be deployed from submarines. Peacetime, we do periscope uh, photography, getting uh, int, including electronic int, signal int, and monitor the activity of both military as well as as the civil activity in the seas. So we have a basis in Vizag and in, uh, and uh, various other places from where uh, we go on various deployments. And of course, we've got to increase the reach to the South China Sea. So that's the kind of canvas we're looking at. The constraint are the distances. Distances are around 3,000 to 4,000 nautical miles if we need to reach the Pacific, so which is a big challenge for the submarines. So that once you plan for submarine deployment, like in the Indo-Pacific region, you have to have effective sea denial as a strategy. The principles of combat deployment are going to be, as I told you, the speeds are slow, out of port time, the time on task, the requirement of a continuous presence, operational turnaround, weapon outfit, the duration of hostilities if they curve, and how much reserves do we have. And the constraints, you know, we, as I told you, the speed is very less. We got to pre-position our submarines. Communication is another issue, as I told you, it is evolving. So to effectively communicate is, is a big challenge. Weapons and sensors, and then we also got to respect international law during our deployments. And of course, less than vast situation, I told you what are the missions. So the factors which come into is what is the nature of the task? What is the kill, kill probability required in that area? The available communication, as I told you, likely targets and what are the anti-submarine activities of our enemy? Like if you're operating in the Pacific or in the South China Sea, what is the ability of the enemy to detect our submarines? Of course, the intelligence we need to have and tell. And we also got to ensure that there's no mutual interference uh, with our, our own Navy and also with our friendly navies. So I'll just come to the challenges specifically for the deployment in the Indo-Pacific region, that South China Sea or the West Pacific, you know, long distance to deployment, and then the fourth levels. Submarines, you know, we, you cannot have a submarine and deploy 365 days. They have the cycles, they have their, um, what you call time for turnaround, for maintenance. So if you want to make a presence in the West Pacific all the time, you got to have at least four SSBNs. That's the kind of, you know, numbers which are required and the weapon outfit they should have the reach uh, so uh, we have a great missile program uh, of course the current one we are restricted by our ranges which is on our Ariane class to around 750 kilometers to this which is not sufficient but with the k4 one that i've taken from open source we're going to have 3500 kilometers and we also have uh, future ones which are going to have 5000 to 6000 kilometers range uh, they are in development stage and we got to expedite that uh, these missiles are sub-launch, so they, uh, from a uh, submarine can launch it from uh, while being submerged. So coming to some other challenges, uh, that is interoperability with other friendly navies. So if we have the, like the Quad and us, we should have effective communication and uh, uh, you know we should be able to operate together in peacetime as well as in war situations. We need to have forward bases because and logistic tie-ups. Uh, with the ASEAN countries and in the Pacific. And once we go for that, we want to ensure the countries which we are going for, they have stable economic and political situation. And there's a congruence of political, military and trade interests. And of course, they should not come under Chinese pressure or be blackmailed by them. And yeah, they should not be in debt, in the Chinese debt. Because developing these bases and forward posts, it's a long drawn thing. You can't just withdraw any day. And of course, we prefer to have island countries or countries which have islands with them. Some of the other factors before forging, uh, you know, friendships and ties is that there should not be any conflict of interest between us and them. And they should have the required infrastructure to support Indian Navy. And yes, as a long term thing, they should be able to provide us jetties, dockyard, repair yards, airfields, uh, communication, stealth hangars, accommodation for a crew and other logistic things. Now, moving to other things, effective sensors we need to have and the terms of engagement. Now, suppose the submarine is there in the Pacific. If, if it's a peace time, what are the terms of engagement? If it's a war time, then how do we tell him to engage? And if there is an attack on the submarine, what should it do? So they, these guys, these all guidelines need to be in the doctrine or in the orders which are passed. 
and of course on the water communication is also i am emphasizing on communication because you know delays must be expected in submarine reacting to the signals you know there are times once some submarine does not receive the signals but the kate for adequate reserve of time so you give an order to the submarine is not going to react immediately it's going to there's going to be a time lapse and there may be times once a submarine required to break is hf silence now significance of hf silence is if you break it your location gets gets known so the, which is certainly not warranted and uh, i will now go from the submarine level to the indian navy uh, what are the challenges for the navy in the indo pacific we certainly have an asymmetry of forces you know some uh, chinese navy is growing by around 14 platforms in a year whereas we are growing by around 4 or 5 and and you know that asymmetry is there we got to see how to uh, you know circumvent that and submarines are are one force multiplier that can do it and we got to have art nirbharta uh, in in the warship construction we got to be you know uh, have our indigenization program which is important yes the navy also has to cater for the string of pearls which is and their deployments and we could also look for an aircraft task force in the pacific in future and also you know the, the enemy may put their task force in the indian ocean region so how do we cater for that some of the steps yes maritime diplomacy is on uh, but we got to be more assertive we got to take more concrete mm-hmm. steps we have done some submarine diplomacy by giving submarine to myanmar but probably with more asean countries we got to engage that and follow similar things we got to have the maritime domain awareness and underwater domain awareness this is very important uh, and is a peace time activity so that once you are operating you know what you going to expect where you get your signals uh, what do you expect how is the ground and how is how are the levels you know sea layers in the sea which are very important and for the navy budget sanctions uh, some of the maritime uh, thing uh, they cost a lot nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers so we got to project to the government and get the sanctions because they are very long drawn functions uh, developing a submarine is not not can't happen over you know not even 5 years so advanced sanctions have to be there and uh, yes uh, i've already covered this part of sensors and the communication so as a way ahead i would say that uh, we certainly need a dynamic indo pacific doctrine which spells out what are the scenarios what are the threats in future keeping slocks keeping the evil designs of china and other countries and uh, the geostrategic uh, strategic developments uh, which are happening we got to be aggressive in our diplomacy and military ties with the asean countries and countries in the pacific uh, which is very important because that area comes uh, very far it is you know our effort is to take the battle to the enemy's backyard then to get it focused here we got to shift the center of gravity which is very important and there is a congruence of interests so i am sure that these countries will come forward but we got to have a strategy for that we have as a totally aggressive indigenization program in which the indian navy the drdo dae dockyards uh, psu and private ones the indian industry and the academic institutions need to work together we have to enhance the maritime capabilities to the said in terms of ssbns ssns uh, the missile program uh, to have greater ranges the aircraft carrier battle groups so so we we got to work on this with with more vigor and we have to give impetus to all our future projects and we also need to amalgamate of advanced technologies because you know ai is coming in there are underwater uh, drones uh, you know like the drones are making waves in in the air they are going to make difference even in the water and then underground gliders <coughs> so these are being developed yeah, so we should be able to use these Uh, also uh, as a force multiplier with that i finish uh, thank you very much jai hind thank you uh, commander sir thank you wonderful uh, presentation from the heights of mount everest as you are a mount everest climber to the borders of the ocean as i said you have covered the the most critical area of indo pacific and that is the maritime challenge and very rightly you have drawn the conclusion that this no peaceful actions will result into any success of any nature in order to have an impact we must have a dynamic indo pacific doctrine of carrying the entire theater thank you very much sir i would uh, uh, now request uh, the the general the senior most 
officer, the senior most authority in the field here, Lieutenant General P.G. Kamath, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, with your permission, yes. I will read the brief introduction, sir, before I hand over yes. to you. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. General Kamath, sir, uh, as the word suggests, is a veteran. He has been awarded Param Vishishta Seva Medal, Ati Vishishta Seva Medal, YSM, and Seva Medal. He is a highly distinguished general who has held some of the most coveted appointments in the Indian Army. He is a notable commentator in defense and national security issues. An alumni of the Sainik School, Bijapur, and NDA Kadakwasla, the general was commissioned in Madras Regiment in June 1973. A cerebral scholar warrior, he is a graduate of Defense Services Staff College, Higher Command Course, and the prestigious National Defense College. The general has commanded an infantry battalion in the line of control of General Krishnu during the peak insurgency activity from 93 to 95. He has also commanded an infantry brigade during the Operation Parakhan and an infantry division with operational drone in the desert and run of guns. His enviable repertoire of staff appointments includes the prestigious tenure a defense advice to the Indian High Commissioner in Malaysia, significant position of Addition Military Secretary Army Headquarters, and Chief of Staff at Command Headquarters. A highly decorated and distinguished official of the Indian of the Indian Armed Forces. Very kind of you, sir, to join the proceedings. And now you have to put to the crown all foundations in whatever manner we could. My colleagues have presented, and you have the crown, sir. General Kamath, sir. Thank you, Dr. Page. It's a privilege to be with your foundation today. And generally, it's not necessarily the senior most is the brightest of all. It's rather the other way. The younger ones are more cerebral, and the older ones might be dishing out older ideas. And hence, the both the combination will give us some solution to our present intractable problems. And I also thank the my co-speakers, wonderful presentation. I learned a lot from you and also from Dr. Page. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, yes. firstly, coming into, let's ju jump into the topic immediately. The, when you talk about the oceans, Atl Atlantic Ocean, the Western is absolutely not unbroken except at Panama Canal and the Magellan Strait. Eastern side is absolutely unbroken except for Mediterranean Sea and Suez Canal. So it is almost a lake. Let me see whether I can uh, put some. Uh, share, share slides. Yeah. If you see, this is unbroken except Panama Canal. Again, this is unbroken except for Mediterranean Sea and Suez Canal. So all that has to go is through the Magellan Strait, the bigger ones, and the smaller ones through the canals. Whereas when you see Indian and Pacific, there is absolutely broken areas on the between the Asia, Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. You see how broken it is, and hence it can be considered sometimes as a single water body. And Indo-Pacific has also, in terms of substantiates its uh, particular heading, in terms of geographical dimensions as well. This is the Straits of Malacca. I'll deal with the maps only. Only then I'll come into my topic. This is South China Sea, Malacca Straits, the most important, where $5.3 trillion of trade of the world passes through and China, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, North Korea are entirely dependent upon this particular sea to give them access into the Indian Ocean. And hence the importance of this and also the world economy will be jeopardized in case there is some obstruction in navigation in the South China Sea. It will empower billions of people and hence the interest of this world and the geocentrality of South China Sea has risen due to the hostile attitude of China, which has started its energy, which has completed its energy. And if you come out of the Malacca Straits, 
what we have is the andaman nicobar archipelago anyone who has to come out of the uh, malacca straits the entire 5.3 trillion dollars of trade has to pass through at our mercies of under andaman nicobar islands the 6 degree channel the 10 degree channel and the duncan channels all these three are under our domination so if there is a actual heels for the china in terms of its economy and its military prowess whatever it has is based on its economic uh, uh, what your dividends we have the opportunity geographically endowed with an opportunity to block obstruct and interfere with this trade we will see the millions and millions of the chinese people will get unemployed because it has become an export intensive country with nearly 36% of its gdp is only on imports and exports so that will have adverse uh, have the effect on its economy so this is one capital geographical capital which we have to make use of all the access from the pacific ocean into the indian ocean is through the malacca straits out here sunda straits lombok straits and the uh, ombai and the timor sea if Ch india has got the capability in terms of navy to see these access routes from south china sea and the pacific when they enter into the indian ocean if we can block it that is the biggest thing what we can achieve in terms of our capability and to coerce china the way we want it to respond I rather I have been to Bali and then went for a kilam for about uh, three hours into the trip by paying into the Lombok Strait to see how choppy the waters are. It is absolutely choppy waters and only congenial uh, well uh, what you call canal they have got is Malacca and then probably Sunda. Then others there are about. you know there are 17000 islands of indonesia to maneuver big ships through these other straits is not going to be easy and as i have told you we'll come out of the malacca straits here are our andaman nicobar islands so china is not in a very very comfortable state in terms of its energy trade lines and other sea lanes of communication if uh, india means business and uh, this is okay now i think i will come i will uh, stop this slide business and then come to Uh, anyway last photo that's why just i will deal on this photo a bit later but just look at the absolutely glum prime minister of sri lanka rajpaksha and look at the happiness concealed in the mask of wangi the foreign minister just much against the protocol a foreign minister is trying to lock his arms with the prime minister and he is too unhappy about it and he is too pleased about it okay then next how do i get this slide out anyone can on the right bottom side you can go to presentation mode there is an icon Okay, one minute, please. Just the uh, bottom four of them will be there, sir. Oh yeah, yeah. Go to the presentation one, then automatically you will be able to move. If you just click on it. Is th is this the presentation mode? The fourth one, sir, to the extreme right. One, two, three. No, it doesn't appear. Where that plus minus is there, sir? Uh, there are four icons. Or on the keyboard, if you just press down, sir, it will come to the next one. Down arrow. Here. 
Oh, just press escape sir once. Escape. So you can simply close it at right so, side uh, top we corner. Host, uh, friend, now we can uh, move on. Okay, I finished my slides. Can I continue now? I am not able to get out of this presentation. Uh, stop sharing, sir. Then press in the center, sir. Green color, brown. Sign oh, oh, yeah, it has gone. Or on top, sir. On top. Yes. Yeah, I have seen one participant can share at a time. Multiple participants. Or admin, can you uh, make him stop sharing? So on top, sir, you'll get stop sharing. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, sorry for all this. Uh, Please pardon me. Now come into the what you call entire markets and all which have been dealt with are uh, dependent upon the Malacca Straits and then come into the oil lifeline to the West Asia and in between is a peninsula of India 1500 kilometers into the south jetting out. So we are geographically we are there in Indian Ocean and it should be our national endeavor to see the Indian Ocean belongs to the Indian Ocean reef countries and India is the security uh, natural provider to entire region. That should be our aim. Now coming to what is China doing? China has rightly said that it's uh, lost in the South China Sea, the permanent court of arbitration on, under the UNCLOS in 2016, which said China has no legal stand eye to the nine dash line. Rather, firstly, it had this uh, ten, uh, 11 dash line, then it came down to nine dash line, and then to include Taiwan, they put a 10 dash line. And in order to show its legal validity, they try to put a, they still now have the land borders on the nine dash line. I mean, imagine the land borders in order to show but it is in a contravention to the UNCLOS. So what did they do? They did uh, now with the four shah's island, they call four shah means four island uh, domain because they did not have a legal validity. You know, China fights its legal warfare. So now they have said four shah's island, which we'll get, that is the Paracel, Spratly, Spratly, Pratas and Metalsfield Bank. Now, one interesting thing I want the people to know, Macclesfield branch is on to the east of Pratas. Even in the Googles, they have dispensed with the Macclesfield brand, brand, and now they are calling it Zonsa Island. That is the Chinese name. You know, in the Chinese, in their long-term vision, they must have paid someone in the IM trying to make an open acquisition, I don't mind. They must have paid someone in the Googles in order to change the name into the Zonsa. Why should it be have a Chinese name on it? Who has given them the authority? China, if it has illegally occupied it, giving it a Chinese name is absolutely illegal and not professional for a company like Googles to dispense with the Metalsfield band and then call it Zonsa and then say it is a Chinese one and write in small bracket it is under dispute. So all these type of things are happening in South China Sea which has added uh, to its uh, what you call uh, 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 to, uh, to its uh, uh, dividends and to the threats and uh, the very idea that the, China, uh, the international waters of South China Sea as a chili, what has it become? It has become a Chinese lake. The free trade, the international order which has to be maintained, rule-based orders of international orders, has been dispensed with when it rubbished the permanent court of arbitration uh, verdict that China doesn't have a low fixed stand eye. Now, what is Japan doing about it? Japan is uh, told that it will increase the 1% GDP cap which it had placed on its defense ministry, on the defense expenditure. It has called this Japanese defense agency into a Japanese defense ministry. And also it has told in no uncertain terms, they have reinterpreted the passive, uh, passive constitution of Japan and reinterpreted it in order to say collective self-defense is also a part of the Japanese constitution. 
and then entered into a treaty of mutual uh, basis and all with Australia and also mutual logistic arrangements with India. So everyone are feeling agitated by what China has done. It's not only India. Now I come to one very interesting fact, which I, this one, the total import of oil by Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and China is $280 billion. Out of this, Southeast Asia produces around $10 billion for exports. So let us say all this will be taken by China, Japan, or someone. Still $270 billion yearly, oil has to come from the Middle East to the East Asia. That's where is its vulnerability and that's where is the strength. Enemy's vulnerability is our strength. Okay. Now I think I'll move a bit to the nuclear dimension. I want to keep my uh, time limited. <clears throat> all, the, all the nuclear power, the P5, Russia, China and um, the US are in the Indo-Pacific. British and France, Britain and France have Indian Ocean territory in the Indian Ocean. In addition, the first base at the Bahrain has been taken over by Britain recently. So all five permanent nuclear powers are based in the Indian Ocean and the Indo-Pacific region. Come to the other, non, other nuclear power, but with a non-nuclear status, whatever you want to call. You take Israel, you take Iran, question mark, you take Pakistan, you take India, you take North Korea. Entire, this entire, all are in the Indo-Pacific. So all the countries who have nuclear capability is there in the Indo-Pacific region. And hence the war has to, if, if there is a nuclear war, it has to originate in this region and hence its importance. Our mankind has realized the difference, the nuclear war has to be there. And we have got hybrid war, the fifth generation war, gray zone warfare, cyber warfare, information warfare, proxy warfare, divide a number of ingenuous in their different types of warfare so that we do not have to resort to nuclear war. But at the same time, it is with whom the trigger in Pakistan is with its Indian, with its Pakistani army, who are developing tactical nuclear weapons, TNWs, and has, swear, and has sworn that it will use it against Indian forces when they enter its own territory, thus giving it the shelter from retaliation, probable shelter. Whereas India is told in no uncertain terms, no first use, but any nuclear, biological and chemical weapons used by against our forces anywhere, anytime, we have got the right to uh, retaliation. North Korean nuclear weapons are under the despot, mercurial in its temperament. When he is going to press, no one knows. So though I would like to discount war, nuclear war, I cannot fully say it is not there. More important is, it is the China's grand strategy that it has got two road nations on its east and west. The eastern one, North Korea, the nuclear weapons, missile weapons, uh, missiles with them, ability of uh, ballistic missiles reaching the United States, reaching Japan and all this, uh, South Korea and all, no problem. It has kept the entire allied, all the enemies of China, at bay due to North Korea. At the same time in the West, there is Pakistan, who have been given uh, chip four designs of nuclear. They were also given what you call as the uh, demonstration of a nuclear explosion in Lucknow. They were given what a highly enriched uranium ring magnet. These are all well documented, doesn't need any more proof in order to ensure Pakistan becomes a nuclear state. So Pakistan is pinned down, pinning down India and India for the last 74, 75 years, 74 years to be precise, is uh, centered its attention towards Pakistan. It's only last year we have done realignment of forces. 
look at the strategic design of China to keep these nuclear and missile powers on its east and western flank and in order to they will fight its proxy war against its adversaries and China will come only as a second line of defense. Look, look at it. It's only India has woken up last year in realigning the forces. Now I come to the basic meat of my program uh, of my uh, paper i will not read it out it will take too long so the indo-pacific doctrine india doesn't have a national security or national strategic doctrine so far with a border which is more than 4000 kilometers disputed 740 kilometers of line of control and a state of jnk under dispute a state of Arunachal Pradesh claimed by China with so much of turbulence on our borders uh, still uh, this country doesn't have a national security doctrine. In one of my discussions when I said that a person very naively asked me why the staff police can write one. It's not that one cannot write. Dr. Page can write, I can write, anyone can write. But what is its use? It's just a trash of paper. Unless a national security doctrine is approved in the Cabinet Committee of Security, signed by the Prime Minister and told what are our national interests, if these are our national interests, what are our military objectives? If these are our military objectives which have to be against, which have to be achieved against foreign powers, what is their capability? And what should be our capability in point of so-and-so time in, let's say, by 2025? And what is the budget allocation which you have to do in order to reach that defense capability at such and such period of time? So the budget allocation takes place. Other ministries will also come in, uh, do their uh, instruments of national power, like the economic power, science and technological power, diplomatic power, soft power, all have to build up into a comprehensive national power with a national security strategy which will harness resources of the country in order to reach those objectives. When you have not done that, what are we talking of the Indo-Pacific doctrine which actually has to flow out of the national security strategy? National security strategy after you have done, then you have got a strategy how to deal with the neighboring countries. You have to do with what you have to do with the uh, outer regions, uh, outer regions, what have to do with USA, what have to do with Africa. These are the twin sub parts which have to emerge. So in absence of a national security strategy, this entire country is absolutely doddering in dark. This is my opinion and I stand by it. But what we have to do next, for example, I give you 2014 to 2019. The present regime itself gave a very, very paltry budget, did not pay attention to the defense at all because that uh, there was a bond homing between uh, Xi Jinping and our Prime Minister. They came to Mamalipuram, they came to Gandhinagar, he went to Wuhan, he came to Banaras. Everyone thought it is all a zero of peace. And only when they struck us in 2020, you realized it is not that. that no intentions of a country can change overnight, but capacity states decades and decades to build up. So those five years we are paying for now, after 2020, we are thinking of a defense budget. We are thinking of what should be our military capacity, because we still do not have a national security strategy, which really tells what is our national goals, which is our military goals. We do not have it. Now coming to my next what should we do in absence of this? We should not renounce, we should renounce the one China policy. I think it was done by Susma Swaraj. We will agree to one China policy if China agrees to our one India policy. First. Then is Arunachal Pradesh is called a Zannan by him and given 15 names to these parts, to, to, uh, to various places in Arunachal. So we should also call Tibet the old Sanskrit name, Shambhala, or call it less simple, C-O-T, China-occupied Tibet. 
do not worry about the protocol which he signed on 29th april 1954 held in tibet as a part of china that was only for 7 to 8 years it has no legal validity now and we call our borders as indo tibetan borders or indo sinkian borders but don't call it sino tibetan borders these words mean a lot to china <coughs> our mea navy tells only one thing do not our perception of lac differs what sorry what damn perception differs your line of uh, your claimed line of international border is johnson's line you don't say our perception of lac differs we just say in the china has intruded into our territory china doesn't say our lac differs they say the china indians have occupied so and so we i just i am quite uh, quite amazed uh, i have uh, written it in my previous article also then second declare that any disturbance by china on the land borders we have got the freedom to act in our national interest in the indian ocean just make a declaration all their trade has to pass through at our mercy just make a declaration there are number of ways you can harass you can delay you can arrest the ships don't worry about the repercussions you have to have if china can come and occupy your territory that doesn't why is china silent in indian ocean in spite of its problems in barahoti in ladakh in leh in uh, in arunachal in sikkim he is doing all this why is he silent in indian ocean because today we have got a power over there second jettison non alignment we have nothing to do with that damn thing we still even in the 76th un general assembly when the heads of state and the foreign minister spoke in september 21 to the united nations not one mention of china's incursion we have done you don't even want to mention that china is incur that's exactly china wants us to behave like that please understand look look at it we are not even let alone having a defense alliance with other countries we are not even able to name china when he has intruded and we have lost 900 square kilometers of territory in depsang in this unless we go across wai junction and petrol tank petroleum point 10 11 12 13 if you don't do it we are losing that territory though he has not occupied it but he is not allowing you to petrol it for the past two years this uh, it is all itbp itbp is not allowed to petrol so this non uh, non alignment and non violence has wasted our time and our resources and our attention has gone into a wrong over a period of time not being able to prepare or bring up our military capacities we are just left whereas look at pakistan it uh, became badat pak it uh, then say sento then seattle if just in if we are members of let's say badat pak or seattle or sento will china would have dared to attack us and capture nine in 1962 because you are weak you are non aligned you didn't have the power they knew how weak you were he came and did it what does chanakya says you have to say you have to make alliances when you are weak and not suffer in silence as you are doing even now even now you don't have a single defense treaty with either usa or with all this communication and all the uh, bases and all are minor mutual defense pact you should have with the us you should have with japan you should have with australia you should have with vietnam we should have it with philippines we should have it with the uh, probably we should have it with indonesia because indonesia and all the straits from south china sea goes through the indian ocean they have op- offered us uh, in uh, two, two years before sabanga uh, uh, base right on the southern edge of malacca straits we should develop it and be a part of it see we are not a, why should we not become a part of otis as uh, uh, dr pagey uh, had said it is uh, it is port plus four port plus otis put it port plus one more uk will join why not so uh, our strategic defense treaty should be with all so that we have we are not shy in order to really tell china what we are then we come to the 
you were what you told 70% of it so we told 60% of our trade is through south china sea and all don't worry already we are we as a nation do not have pride the present trade turnover with china is 125 billion dollars pre covid it was around 80 or 90 we are buying things from china let the chinese trade be disrupted doesn't matter all of us collectively we should buy out chinese goods chinese mobile phone itself is 100 billion dollars why are you buying chinese phones what are we why we as a nation cannot take a single stand against a nation which has intruded into our territory claims 90000 square kilometers of arunachal pradesh brahmos and all thank god we are giving it to philippines Vietnam has been asking since long. Of course, we have to get over the uh, hiccups with Russia because Russia has to approve these sales. We have, we have to. Then, then uh, I got lot to say, but my time is ending. So, alliance of uh, lower riparian states, I had said, there are about ten states: Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Thailand. We have Thailand, then uh, uh, Myanmar. Uh, then uh, laos cambodia vietnam all they offers get rivers from tibet because tibet is the uh, third uh, is the biggest reservoir for of fresh water lakes all these waters come to us and china as a upper riparian state has been absolutely responsible it's building up a number of dams at the uh, across brahmaputra mekong has actually become a trickle See these ten nations have to leave Pakistan aside and Cambodia, Laos. Seven, eight nations have to join together and form an organization of lower riparian states of, of water of rivers originating from Tibet and pose a counter to China in terms of economic challenge, in terms of diplomatic, uh, diplomatically to shame it. This has to be done. And lastly, I will wind up. The national security doctrine is very important. when a constitution is formed on the 26th uh, january 1950 by 1951 we should have had a national security doctrine now it is 2000 uh, whatever you want to 22 we still don't have one which is signed by the cabinet committee on security which is paving the way for india to move forward unfortunately we have lost lot of time we have no more time to lose only thing which i hope the nation has learned strength deters war and weakness invites it jai hind thank you very much sir for uh, your passionate and uh, highly factual uh, presentation you have covered uh, as we said you you said the crowd and whatever by the three colleagues that said you have uh, given a very different Uh, direction to the entire discussion where you state that the national security doctrine has to come and dynamic indo pacific theater should be a part of it and you have given all the right reasons for it but i believe that something is better than nothing sir we got to make and we have to got to create enough noise of the indo pacific theater doctrine that the tail shall wag the dog and the talk that we raise and the dust that we raise the kind of specter that you have drawn where for every single move that the chinese make on the border you capture their one ship this is a simple solution they are all passing through indian ocean but unless we china believe that we are able to counter them in the marine aspect they are not going to move an inch and mere 100 km 100 meters on the border either side of pomong so may not have enough significance to the chinese because if they put if they put 50000 they will put 100000 people but what they cannot afford to miss is this vital supply line and as you know they are building a pipeline through russia which will obviate uh, uh, some of the difficulties which they are there on the on the on the, on the china uh, south china sea side they may be partly reduced if this is the pipeline on on the ground takes place talks are on so their dependence will be reduced in petroleum but at this stage and maybe for the next 5 years they are highly dependent and we must use this opportunity 
to make them understand that it is state for that the purpose of this discussion today sir that through our small humble effort and your contribution the powers that be are convinced that there is a need to act and that no peace nix will rule the earth the south china sea is not going to be real not going to be ruled by any peaceful means but only through what commander abhishek karman mentioned the the submarine uh, the submarine location by strengthening bases all along by creating economic and military partnerships only through these efforts and then the diplomatic part by signing pacts by signing mutual defense treaty everything will have to come in place to protect us from the invasion which may happen any time but now is the right time for us uh, to get together the act of all the three forces and the, as you say the cabinet committee of security the highest body should take a note of this sir in your presentation you had mentioned that strength deters war you had said strength deters war and weakness invites it that is the truth sir we have invited war because of our weakness so unless we display our strength partially depicted today at the 26 january parade but actually use it in dynamic fashion link other countries also to use it because we must take note of the fact that though usa and 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 the, and, and the americans and the british have more than 70 nuclear submarines they have tied up with australia to locate submarines in the south australian part which would be a kind of a shadow as far as the chinese outrage is concerned which also means that there is a nuclear deterrent we have to be a part of it by signing treaties by building our own capabilities as he mentioned ariane 567 are bigger vessels but we must be a part of it and having the deterrent and having using our aggressive policy to counter the chinese is the only way out for dynamic indo pacific theater doctor sir uh, i'm grateful to you sir for your uh, uh, passionate presentation also grateful to my colleagues the colonel venkatram uh, commander abhishek kannan and uh, professor gupte who is not keeping well to all of them to all my other colleagues who shared uh, their thoughts uh, wing commander pradeep desh pandey who could not join us today so all of them uh i express my deepest uh, gratitude and hope that this doctrine uh, propounded by you sir should be a starter and we should be able to move ahead and the government of india should start laying foundations of a national security doctrine based on the indo pacific realities if that happens um, yeah, i would say it would be some effort in that direction but the strategic nuclear submarine initiative is the trigger south of australia which means we got to be a part of all these efforts only then we can hope some semblance of peace in near future so i heartily thank you sir thank all uh, my other colleagues and uh, distinguished participants for today uh, who have taken time from the uh, 26 january program i'm sure the beating the retreat must be on so I, i thank you once again sir and hope that we shall connect some other time on some such issue and we shall take every effort to see that the document that we have presented today would reach the right places for their thought and action thank you very much sir and god bless sir thank you sir thank you bagas thank you thank you abhishek kanal sir thank you very much thank you dr pagye thanks a lot and grateful to you for the thank you. opportunity thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir jai hind sir